the, the essential way to do that is to oversample the domain of beliefs, subject them to a factor analysis, and see how they cohere. And we found that there were two factors that were associated with politically correct belief, and that they were very powerfully predicted by personality, most particularly by trait agreeableness, which was not a predictor of conservatism or liberalism, particularly. But, but more to the point, the student who's doing that, uh, her name is her, her name is Christine Brophy. She's a very brave girl, very very tough girl, and uh, she's she's pursued this forthrightly, and it's led to nothing but opportunity crazy amounts of opportunity. Now, it's a tough road to hoe. She knows perfectly well she's not going to be very popular in certain domains, but, but, but that's no reason not to pursue something. The issue is, are you interested in it? Do you want to find out the truth? Are you willing to pursue it? And are you willing to stake yourself on that? And if, if the answer is no, then you're not willing to stake yourself on yourself, and then God help you, because you'll have to be given something by someone else to stake yourself on, and they can always take it away. Mm -hmm. So it's like, don't be thinking, don't be thinking politically about your career. It's foolish. It doesn't work. It really doesn't work. You'll be second rate at best. You'll be second rate and frightened at best. You'll never hit the top ranks if you perform like that. And having said that, I would also say, don't be an idiot. Don't make unnecessary enemies, right? I mean, there's no point in making unnecessary enemies. That's that's not wise. But don't sell yourself short. You know, you might be on the cutting edge of an entire new domain of psychology if you actually get it right. And so maybe you won't be popular among your superiors for the time being. You can't talk to the people who are above you in a dominance hierarchy anyways. It's virtually impossible. You can barely talk laterally. You pretty much have to broadcast your message down. And so the fact that, well, enough said about that. Yeah. No, it's a bad idea. Pursue your damn research. <laughs> Tell the truth about it and let the chips fall where they will. will. You're much better protected that way than by doing anything else. Second question. Have universities been ruined by Marxism or rather by the massive growth of student life bureaucracies that seek to train rather than educate? They haven't been completely ruined, but the humanities and the social sciences are both in trouble. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Could you please speak to the legitimacy of Harvard's decision to penalize students for being part of single gender organizations that are not officially recognized by the university? Uh, for example, fraternities, sororities, and final clubs. It's cowardly. It's cowardly. It's politically correct. It interferes with freedom of association. So I would think they would have more important things to do. Mm -hmm. All right. Do you think... Do you think that victimhood narratives and critiques of oppression, which make up much of the political discussion on college campuses, are a symptom of a psychological need to deflect guilt because of, because of a lack of another better method of redemption? Yeah, I, I think that is part of it. I mean, because I don't, I don't, it's not, I'm speaking more strongly in some sense than perhaps would be optimal, partly because time is short. I know that young people have a messianic urge. Piaget actually identified that as, as part of the developmental process uh, that, 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 was, that typified late adolescence. And it's admirable in many ways. It needs to be directed in the most powerful, possible, powerful, pro-social manner possible. And that's what the university should be doing. And by training students to be noisy, ill-informed, historically ignorant agitators, narcissistic agitators, let's add that, they're doing them a tremendous disservice. Like when I was at McMaster, for example, where the last very vocal protest occurred, mostly what I felt about the protesters was sorrow. Because, you know, I looked out there, I saw, well, there's these, they're young people, they're university students, they're, they went to university, at least in principle, to learn something about themselves and about the world, and instead they've been transformed into these, like, they were chanting, they were chanting, like, uh, profanities at me. 
I mean, really? That's the best you can do? You're, you come out in your dopey little group, you hide behind the hammer and sickle because one of your fashionable professors convinced you that was a good idea, and the best you can do is organize yourself and chant profanities at me. You know, it's so sad. These are, these are, they could be doing something better than that. I mean, God, come out and have a useful protest of some sort, at least. If you're going to come out and protest, make it a high quality protest instead of like cursing at me repetitively. It's so dull and unimaginative and, and pathetic. And so, no, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> Eight more. Okay. <laughs> Five minutes. In cases where people have sworn chastity throughout life, under voluntary and non-coercive circumstances, is it possible to still develop fully and not suffer from the consequences of having never undergone sexual mat maturation? If so, how is it possible? <laughs> wow. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't expect that one, I can tell you. <laughs> Sometimes people have to make a sacrifice, right? And everyone always has to make sacrifices. I mean, that's actually something that I learned from Greek mythology. The ancient myths always talk about sacrifice. And people claim not to understand what that means. You always have to let go of something in order to progress into the future. In fact, that's the most fundamental discovery human beings ever made, as far as I can tell, because it's, it's exactly the same thing as discovering the future. And we discover the future. We're the only creatures that we know of who really can conceive of the future. And the future is something that's made better by letting go of things in the present, right? That's impulse control. So you can look at it that way if you want. The person who wrote this is obviously wrestling with something, you know, and maybe they're wrestling with a hyper dominant sexual impulse that, 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 that threatens to be master instead of servant. And so who knows what they have to do in order to bring themselves under control? I would say that less radical solutions might first be advised but I can right because you don't have to you don't want to whip yourself with a bigger whip than you need to use right I think that's that's minimal necessary force doctrine essentially but so yeah so that's how I can answer that question yeah. pretty good for one you weren't expecting <laughs> Dr. Peterson, you say that the meaning of life is to take an individual responsibility for the burdens of existence. If each person can justifiably choose his own way of taking on these burdens, then how can we prevent individuals from committing actions that are clearly moral injustices? Well, we can't. Hmm. I mean, I think that happens all the time. I think the best, I mean, there's all sorts of mechanisms for regulating it. We have all sorts of mechanisms for regulating. Um, civil society and policing regulates. Expectations between family members and friends regulate. Your conscience regulates. Um, but I don't believe that people do, as a general rule, commit illegalities or, or worse because they've taken on responsibility. Like, that isn't how it works. Pathway to criminality is not to be found in the adoption of responsibility. You don't say that about criminals. Well, if he would have just taken on a little less responsibility, then he wouldn't be in jail. No, that isn't how it works. So, what the question is more something like, well, if people are allowed to direct themselves, how do you stop them from picking a path that's, that's improper? And I would say that that I, I do believe that that's the essential question. I would say part of that is that if you're going to be self-directed, let's say least to some degree, then you have to tell the truth. Otherwise, you pathologize yourself and you can't rely on your own judgment. That's part of the reason why the truth is so necessary. If you're going to use yourself as the mechanism by which you orient yourself in the world, then you better make sure that you're not transforming yourself into something that's predicated on error. So, so it, the, 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 the attempt to speak the truth is a, is a form of psychophysiological hygiene that's one way of thinking about it and if if you're oriented as well as you can towards the articulated truth then you can increasingly rely on your own judgment and that's and that's the that's the best defense against against the dark side 
You've attached a number of useful ideas. Ooh, this is a fun one. You number of useful ideas, for instance, self-overcoming, personal responsibility, to a viral need, social justice conflict. How can we attach useful ideas to the social justice side of this controversy and convert it into a growthful movement for all involved? Well, I do think that is what's happening. Political dialogue that's emerging is precisely that. I don't know how we can do it. I know what I know how I've been doing it to some degree. I've been doing it by saying what I think mm -hmm. and carefully, you know, and and knowing that I'm prone to error and listening to feedback because I would like to know where I'm making errors. I had advisors, my friends while I was undertaking this, who were telling me constantly everything I was doing that was second rate and, and egotistical and careless and all of those things. And so I would say, I would say to some degree, maybe that question is spe specified at the wrong level of analysis, is that you should, you should learn to articulate what you think and that's what you have at your disposal. And, and with you people in the audience, man, you've got power at your disposal. You're all super bright and super conscientious. And like, you know, you're powerhouses. You might not know it. And maybe some of you have forgotten that because you've come to Harvard and of course, so 50% of you are below average at Harvard. But that doesn't mean that you're not like, hyper capable because you're hyper capable. Mm -hmm. So get your act together and say what you think. And that'll do the trick, man. That'll, 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 that'll work just fine. Dr. Peterson, we're running out of time, so I'm gonna ask you one last question. I think it's an, an important one, especially for some of the people who don't think you should be speaking here today, whether some of them are in this room or some of them were outside earlier. The question reads, given extremely elevated violence and murder rates against trans people, why have you chosen to threaten a population that is already facing job discrimination, murder, et cetera? Oh, I'm not threatening them. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any evidence the fact that a handful of noisy activists consider me a threat is no criteria of proof of any sort of anything. Mm -hmm. And I mean, so, so I just reject that entire, all, every single word in that question is meaningless as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. So people think I, someone said, just because someone said that what I said is a threat to trans people does not make it true. Mm -hmm. And I have the, the testimony of a fair number of trans people that that's actually not only not true, it's palpably false. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, not guilty. Very Canadian of you to apologize there. <laughs> yeah, but not so much to say that I'm not guilty. Can I ask a follow-up question? Um, I, I suppose. So, your, your talks at the University of Toronto have led to threats against trans students directly after how do you take no responsibility for that violence? Well, first of all, I, won't, I don't consider threats violence. So we have to be very careful when we use our words. So, so someone saying something and What's someone that? Try to keep it relatively are brief. Not, are not the same thing. And second, there's no possible way I can answer that question because I know nothing about the threats. I know nothing about who uttered them. I know nothing about who reported them. It's so, it's, your question is basically, some people said some bad things after I talked. It's like, could be, but I have no idea what to do about that, and I don't take responsibility for it. It's not specific enough to take responsibility for it. Okay, sorry, um, we do, we, the Hupti officers have to go home. Um, I appreciate that you have an opinion, but at some point, <laughs> um, at some point we do need to call the day.